You knew something strange was happening when you heard the music. What you probably knew is that Alan was preaching, right? <laughs> In 1988, a movie was released. It was the movie Cocktail. Later that same year, a song from the soundtrack made its way to the number one position in the United States Billboard charts. It wasn't long after that before that very song made it halfway around the world and became the number one song in the world coming from that movie. The name of the song? Don't Worry, Be Happy by Bobby McFerrin. What's unique about that song is that it was the very first song to make it to the Billboard 100 that was classified as a a cappella reggae song. A cappella reggae song. Now, what does that mean? Well, a cappella means that there was no accompaniment. It's actually an Italian word, which means um, likening to the chapel in its direct translation. But the point of it is... Everything that you heard on that track was done by the human voice or it was done by the human body. And Bobby McFerrin had a very unique style in kind of making sound and making music. So it was the very first song of its kind to make it on a national and international level in terms of acclaim that had no musical instruments except the human voice. Wow, that's pretty cool. What's interesting though about the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy is that it comes from a phrase that was made popular by a gentleman named Meher Baba. My guess is most of you don't know who that is. He was an Indian mystic and philosopher. And he was known to be able to communicate with his followers in the West, meaning outside of uh, his native country, by using that phrase, don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy. Eventually Bobby McFerrin got wind of it and he turned it into a song and the rest is history. But many of us are not aware at, of the original long version origins of that phrase. When Mr. Baba wrote to his followers he would actually make this statement, do your best then don't worry be happy. In my love I will help you. That's a wonderful statement. I have no idea what it means, but it's a very profound, interesting thought, particularly when you follow Bobby McFerrin's music. Around 1988, 1989, Bobby McFerrin was interviewed, and in the interview, he actually made this statement. He said, whenever you see a poster of Meher Baba, you see the slogan, don't worry, be happy. It's a pretty real philosophy in four words. A pretty real philosophy in four words. Now, those of us here in church would listen to that phrase and say, mm, that's nice, try to figure out what Bible verses that come from, or is that the NIV, the nearly inert version, or is that some other kind of, you know, that's kind of strange, but if we would go outside of the church, meaning we here in this room, or to walk outside into our everyday lives, my guess is as we go through the course of a day and a week, we would probably find ourselves adhering to that philosophy to some degree. Don't worry about it. Just be happy. It's going to be fine. It'll work out. In other words, it's all good. What these two men were really trying to say in this statement is very simple. They're talking about bliss. They're talking about the concept of bliss, which is perfect happiness and great joy. In other words, it's delight, it's pleasure, it's euphoria. And I say, you know what? That's not bad. Okay, I can deal with that. Don't worry, be happy. I like that. But I've got one question for you, and here it is. How? How? Don't worry, be happy, but how? Don't worry about what's happening around the world. Just be happy. How? How? Bodies changing, kids are growing, going off to wherever, but we're empty nesters now, but they keep coming back. I haven't figured that out yet. But anyway, don't worry, be happy. But how? I mean, wh how? That's the basic question. How? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to look at another song. This song may be familiar to you, but let's talk a little bit about the songwriter. The songwriter who's going to give us the answer to our question of how to don't worry and be happy is a renaissance man. This is a great guy. 
He came from a very, very big family. He was a rancher. He was a musician. He was a ladies' man. He was a politician. I'm talking about David, King David, the songwriter. And in the book of Psalms, which is translated song, he actually writes the answer on how not to worry and be happy. And it's found in Psalm number one. And the way I learned it in the Old, uh, Old Testament and King James Version, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate both day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf will not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. The ungodly, they are not so. They're like the chaff that the wind drives of the way. That's why the unrighteous, the ungodly, will not stand in the assembly of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the unrighteous. And the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly or unrighteous, that way will perish. So here we go. You ready for this? I hope so. This great songwriter, David, only gives us two points. <clears throat> only two points, and here it is. Here's the first one. Happiness is not an emotion. It is cultivated, a cultivated state of mind and heart. Point number one. Happiness is not an emotion. It is a cultivate, cultivated state of mind and heart. Here's the second point. Happiness leaves long-lasting evidence. Happiness leaves long-lasting evidence. So you got those two points written down, positioned in your mind, and here we go. Since happiness is not an emotion, and it's actually cultivated, what's it cultivated from? It's cultivated from two things. First, the things that you do and the things that you don't do. It's cultivated by the things that you do and the things that you don't do. So let's first take a look at the things that you're not supposed to do. And here they are. The three things, things that really kill happiness, an ungodly worldview, an ungodly lifestyle, and ungodly relationships. An ungodly worldview, ungodly lifestyle, ungodly relationships. It says in the scripture, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, talking about ungodly worldview. Now, I don't think anybody is going to leave here this afternoon and go find someone to give them counsel that they would consider to be ungodly. I sincerely doubt that that's going to happen. However, I wonder how many of us would be able to say that we're not going to engage in an ungodly worldview. And this is what I mean by that. We just finished Christmas. <clears throat> Merry Christmas to all of you. If you and I, or I, felt that this was a great Christmas because we gave all the things we wanted to give, or received all the things that we wanted to receive, then I wonder if we're engaging or very, very close to having an ungodly worldview. What do I mean by that? You see, the meaning for the season is not the self-centered view that I give because it makes me feel good to give, or I receive because it makes me feel good to receive. That's what goes on. We give and we receive, right? But it's the motivation behind the action. So if we find ourselves saying, I had a great Christmas because I gave all the stuff I really wanted to give because it's about me. And it's always about me. Seeing you happy, it's about me. And I got all the stuff I wanted to get because it's about me. I love to get stuff and it's awesome. It's great. Oh, what a great Christmas. If that's where we find ourselves, I wonder if we're teeter-tottering at the very edge of a perspective that says we have an ungodly worldview. That's just one illustration, but think about it for a second. The first killer to happiness is an ungodly worldview. Here's another one. We as believers hold to some pretty strong beliefs dictated by the Word of God. If we find ourselves in a position, if we are husband and wife married in a covenantal relationship, we find ourselves saying that for whatever reason I can walk outside of my marriage then I wonder if we're teeter-tottering 
on having a godly, an ungodly world view. You see, everybody does it. That's just the way it is right now, right? 67% of Christian marriages end in divorce. Barring mitigating circumstances, yes. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, you got your hair in a twist. Now you want to go do something different. Everybody's supposed to be okay with it. <gasps> I wonder, I really wonder if we're getting close to teeter-tottering to this ungodly world view. So the first killer, the first killer to happiness is having an ungodly worldview. Then the second one is an ungodly lifestyle. The scripture says, nor stands in the path or the way of the sinner. He's talking about the manner of life. He's talking about behavior. Am I doing things that the sinner would do? Can I identify myself with those who don't name the name of Christ? And I look so much like them. I'm not talking about the car, the house, how we dress, goatee, no goatee, processed hair, no process. <laughs> no, I'm not talking. I'm talking about my innards are my innards more like your innards and you have nothing to do with Jesus Christ but man we could be twins <sighs> all of a sudden you know what I think I got dangerously close to the edge dangerously dangerously close to the edge and my joy my bliss my happiness is now on the endangered species list because I behave more like the ungodly than I do the godly so the first one is an ungodly worldview. That's the first killer. The second killer of happiness is an ungodly lifestyle. And now the third one is an ungodly relationship or ungodly relationships. The verse says, nor sit in the seat of the scoffer. Standeth in the way of the sinner, sitteth in the seat of the scorn scoffer or the scornful. The scornful, the scoffer, that is an individual that is diametrically opposed to the things of Christ. I am so against God and everything he stands for and the church and everything it stands for and morality and decency and everything that's encompassed within the teachings of scripture. I am the opposite of that. And if that's who you're hanging out with, no, I'm not talking about not being with unbelievers. You're going, hey, but you're the outreach guy. We're supposed to be out there mixing it up, right? Yeah, you are, but that's not what I'm talking about. If I find myself wrapped in a relationship with somebody or an entity or a organization that is so antithetical to the things of God and I'm cool to be in that okay time to talk you buy the coffee <laughs> there's something probably wrong wouldn't you say you see blessed is the man or woman that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth or identifies with the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Those are the three killers of happiness, the bliss that we really want to have. Don't worry, be happy. Well, yeah, you can don't worry and be happy, but you, you got you to not be doing these things because happiness, joy, bliss, long-lasting peace through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a gift, yes, but also a result of cultivating this attitude and this mindset. So the first thing you do, you don't do that stuff and then you cultivate it by doing the right kinds of things. And here they are. These are the things that promote happiness. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, when we see law, we are thinking about the time when this passage was actually written. And, of course, at the time, what would have been available would have been the law of Moses. Now, we can't stop there. It, now it means much more and broader since we have the full counsel of Scripture. And we recently walked through a series, Can You Trust the Bible? Absolutely, we can. So for us as believers in this day and time, the law of the Lord encompasses all that has been written in the full canon of Scripture. However, going back to the time, that's what they had access to. But what was this law of Moses anyway? It was the moral and civil law of God to his people. Basically, how to act, what to do, how to live. It was his code of conduct for being his people. So this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to dive into the word of God, cultivated by things to do. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. Now this is very interesting. To talk about meditating, to meditate every day and every night, 
Of course, he's not talking literally about in the morning time, the evening time. The implication is throughout the day, throughout the entire day, to meditate on the word of God. Two really great pictures for this word meditate. The first is that of an avarice hungry lion waiting in the tall grass. Hot peppered breath, low growl. And he sees the little fawn skipping through the grass of the Mountain View parking lot. <laughs> and then dangerously and perniciously, he pounces. And that's one picture of meditate. He has intentionality and focus on getting it. And he's waiting patiently in the tall grass. And the second one has to do with a cow. Now, I am told, since I don't know any cows personally, I'm told that cows have more than one stomach. I believe between three and five. And it's my understanding is that when they eat, their food goes down and it makes its way through the five stomachs. And they have the ability to draw out of any stomach at any time and revisit their meal. And then send it back down for more processing. So at each time, they're able to pull more nutrients out of their food and interrupt or continue this digestive process that they have. So it goes down once. Boy, that was good. A little while later, it comes back again. Hmm, slightly different twist. Then it goes down again. And one more time, it comes back. Ah, oh, yes, I remember that. Ah, but now there's a further dimension to this green grass. And it keeps going on and on. You see the point? Okay, meditate. Go for it like you're really going to get it and you make the effort and the time and the energy, but also you stew on it and you stew on it and you bring it back and you bring it back. You bring it back, you bring it back. In his law, does he meditate all throughout the day? Now, the results of this process, this is the process. This is how happiness is cultivated by what you don't do and by what you do and by spending time within the Word of God with intentionality and focus and doing it over time knowing that you can keep going back to it, gaining new insight, new insight, and new insight. And of course here, we talk so much about context, which is critically, critically important as we study the Word. But it doesn't stop with context alone. From context, it goes to understanding. And from understanding, it then moves to insight. And then from insight, it then moves to action. So the point of meditating so deeply on the Word of God with intentionality and focus and revisiting it is to take action. Is to take action. So first we see happiness is an emotion. It's not an emotion. It is a cultured state of heart and mind. And secondly, we see that happiness leaves long-lasting evidence. Long-lasting evidence. So what does that evidence look like? Let's look at the verse here. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. Every time we use the word like, those of you that still remember your English classes, uh, I believe that is called a comparison using like or as. What is the word for that? Simile. That's right. A simile. Yes, and we have a teacher back there. So this simile uses the word like, and so it is a comparison, but what is it comparing us to? Force is telling us he shall be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in its season. So who's going to be like that? What's going to be like that? He's talking about the man or woman that engages in the Word of God, the person that is cultivating peace, the person that's cultivating joy and bliss and happiness. This is what it looks like being planted by rivers of water, sustenance perpetually. Wow, that would be cool. Yielding his fruit in his season. It is my firm belief that what happens in the physical world mirrors the spiritual world. What happens in the physical world mirrors the spiritual world. So we as people, we are born, we grow, we reach an age of maturity, we then reproduce, we then put our energies and focus and energies into our children. We watch them grow. We enjoy their accomplishments. And then we move to the twilight years of life. And that cycle repeats over and over and over and over. We call that life. 
We call that life. In the spiritual realm, I believe it actually mirrors this exact same process. So this passage of scripture says that he will bring forth his fruit in his season. There is a season of ministry, seasons of productivity, seasons of high yield, seasons of less high yield, seasons of having been through ministry experiences where we can now invest our lives in other people and watch them and cheer them on as they go to their heights and they replicate the process. There are seasons in ministry. Happiness is derived from the seasons. Now what happens? His leaf will not wither and whatever he does will prosper. This speaks to legacy. Of course, I would love to say, come in a relationship with the Lord, enter in a Bible study, everything starts to go north. Right. right. Okay, you know, it's just, that's just not reality. There are peaks and valleys and dips and lows, and it's an incredible ride where we experience the grace of God, but boy, it's a ride, isn't it? It's a ride. And he concludes by saying this, as he contrasts what we're supposed to be like, the things that we're going to gain, he makes it very, very clear, this great songwriter, this great politician, this great rancher, this David guy, answers the issue of how to achieve bliss by showing us the opposite of bliss. This is what he says, the wicked are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The way of the wicked will perish. The metaphor is this. Even though the weather is very, very warm today, imagine that we had more appropriate winter weather for the season. And it was maybe a little bit rain outside and uh, there were still leaves on the ground. Not green leaves, but brown leaves. And as we're walking across the parking lot or going to the mall, we see the leaves that haven't been swept up yet. And they're kind of, kind of floating down the road. And we kind of step on them as we go to our next destination, knowing that when the rain comes to, it's all going to wash it away and it's going to be a faint memory. Then the new season will be here and the whole thing will start again. Those without a life of joy and bliss in Christ are very much like the brown, dry leaves. They're here today for a minute, but after a while, you don't really notice as you walk on top to your destination, knowing that they're going to pass. And then some others will take their place, and the cycle goes and goes and goes and repeats. And we don't really notice Very different from the longevity and the legacy that God is telling us that we are to build. But there will be like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So here it is. As we come to a close, don't worry, be happy. But in the process of your happiness, in the process of pursuing and cultivating this response and this discipline of happiness, recognize this. There are things you're supposed to do and there are things you're not supposed to do. (laughs) And your happiness will leave clues. It will have longevity and it will bless people. You know what's really interesting about this entire passage? And I love this. At no point in any of these six verses does this songwriter say anything about emotion. At no point did he say anything about emotion. And we're taught, our prevailing assumption in this day and time is we're supposed to be happy means we're supposed to feel something. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. The feeling should never be the motivation for any type of action. It should be action that moves us into a feeling, knowing that we're pleasing God, which inspires joy and contentment and peace. It starts there. The feelings come. Fine. Love feelings. Wonderful stuff. Don't get the cart before the horse. So what is this happiness thing? What is this bliss thing? What is this joy? Don't worry. Be happy. What is it? How does one do it? 
It starts with Father God initiating, right, initiating righteousness for his children. It starts there. It starts with us being convicted of our sinful state, knowing that we deeply, desperately need a Savior, and then transitioning into the reality that it's got to happen here and it's got to happen now. And I bring nothing to the table. My pockets are empty, bank accounts dry, there's nothing. God, I surrender me to you. And then the process begins. The process of discovering and finding joy, happiness, and bliss. It all begins with the Savior. It all begins with Jesus, the reason for our season. This is the ultimate happiness. This is bliss, and this is joy. So, Bobby and Miss Bobby McFerrin and Mr. Baba, don't worry, be happy. How? Yeah, we know how. We know how because we've been introduced to the Savior.